This is the second video in the third line of defense video series. In this portion of the video series, we are going to be discussing the humoral response. There are two different aspects of the third line of defense. There is the humoral response and the cell mediated response. The humoral response involves B cells and sometimes referred to as the antibody response as B cells are the type of cells that are going to create antibodies, more specifically plasma cells. In addition, Helper T cells are going to play a part in the humoral response, and that is so that it can activate this response. But in this video, we're going to talk about just the humoral response, and in the next video, we'll talk about how it is activated. So to begin, we need to discuss how the humoral response is associated with antibodies. And antibodies are going to be secreted by plasma cells, and they all have the same general shape. and it's going to be a Y shape. Antibodies are all the same in one portion and then they differ in another. In the blue, this is a conserved or it's going to be an area that is always the same with antibodies. This is the protein structure that is going to be found with every single antibody and the top of the antibodies are going to vary depending on the memory. For example, these N pieces, these called the antigen binding sites, they're going to bind to the specific antigen. So this antibody, let's say, could perhaps bind to tetanus, but therefore it wouldn't bind to cholera. They're two different things. And so these are going to vary in the red, and then the blue is going to stay the same and be conserved. And we have four different types of antibodies. IgG, IgA, IgM, and IgE. Ig stands for immunoglobulin. The official term for the antibody protein is an immunoglobulin protein, and, but we abbreviate as Ig many times, and we don't normally call them immunoglobulins, we call them antibodies. Another thing to make note here is if you memorize the acronym GAME, G-A-M-E, those are your four antibodies that you need to know for this class. There are different aspects that you need to understand with these four antibodies, and that's what we are going to discuss now. IgG is going to be the most abundant in serum. Serum is part of the blood, so therefore another aspect of looking at this is that IgG is going to be most abundant within the blood itself. Another critical thing to know with IgG is that it can cross the placenta. IgG is going to be the antibody that protects the fetus as it's growing within the womb. And the last aspect of IgG is that it is a monomer shaped. So it is just a basic Y shaped. IgA is going to be found in your mucous membranes. It's going to be found in your secretions. And a special secretion that I'm going to make note of that's important is that it is found in breast milk. So breast milk has antibodies which are going to protect the baby after birth. So IgG protects it before birth, IgA protects it after birth. And the shape of IgA is a dimer. So dime means two, so it's going to be two antibodies connected together. IgM, the most important thing is to know that it is the first produced. So when you're first exposed to a microbe and you're building memory, this is the antibody that is going to be first produced.
Its shape is a pentamer. Penta means five, so there's five of them together. Because of the size, pentamer, meaning five together, you can infer and know that this antibody is the biggest and most complex. So it looks like a snowflake. IgE is going to be used for parasites, but in this class, in this course, we don't discuss parasites too much, and so IgE is mostly going to be associated with allergies. And it is a monomer as well. If you need time writing down these antibodies and drawing them out, I recommend you pause the video and do so now. The graph which I have just drawn is going to help us understand the way antibodies are produced, or how antibodies are seen within the first exposure and second exposure. We're only going to focus on two of the antibodies though, and the two antibodies we're going to focus on are IgM and IgG. When you're first exposed to a microbe, and you're building memory, what is the first antibody that is produced? As we previously just mentioned, it is IgM. In addition, you're not going to be able to create IgM immediately. You're going to have a little bit of a lag phase because your body has to be able to create memory and so all the different types of cells have to be able to communicate with each other in order for them to begin to produce IgM. So there's going to be a lag phase, and then it's going to go up and come down after the microbe is eliminated. So blue is IgM. IgG is going to have a little bit further lag time because it's not the first produced. It's going to draw a little bit further lag time, and it's going to go up and come back down. And it doesn't go quite as high as IgM. And this is what the first exposure looks like, how antibodies are produced. In the second exposure, however, they're going to flip roles. First off, there's not going to be the lag phase because now you've just created memory within this first exposure. So in the second exposure, it can immediately start making antibodies. There's going to be a lot more IgG. and less IgM. So understand that the first time you're exposed, you're going to have a lag phase and IgM is going to be the first created. And this is because IgM has more antibodies to attach to, since it's a pentamer, it has more regions to bind to, and so it's acting as if it's playing catch up with the microbe. The body's already falling behind, so in order to catch up to where the microbe is at and eliminate it, it's going to make the IgM. However, the second exposure, it's going to have the memory, so it's going to create IgG, which will be a lot quicker to create, and it's going to be able to eliminate the microbe, and therefore you're not going to be able to be sick from this microbe the second time around. If you need time drawing out this graph of the exposures, I recommend you pause the video and do so now. The last aspect that we're going to discuss with antibodies are going to be their functions. All antibodies are flagging things for destruction. They're flagging an antigen or a microbe. They're flagging it for the immune system to say, hey, this needs to be destroyed. It's foreign to the body. In addition to flagging things for destruction, they're going to have additional functions that help the immune system clear out the microbe. And that's what we're going to discuss now. The first one is called opsonization. Opsonization literally means to make tasty. Or in other words, this is going to enhance phagocytosis. By enhancing phagocytosis, it's going to allow the phagocytes to eliminate the microbe more easily. 
Imagine if you're hungry and you see a hamburger on a table. You're already really hungry. You're likely to go eat that hamburger. Now let's say you throw on your favorite topping, whether it's cheese, ketchup, pickles, whatever it may be. Now you look at that hamburger and it says, Phew, that's a lot better. I really want to eat that now. And that's exactly what the antibodies are doing for the phagocytes. Phagocytes will eat the microbe. They're hungry. It's a hamburger. And then you coat it in antibodies. That's their favorite topping. And so now they're going to be able to eat more quickly and they're going to be able to eat it more easily. Another thing is that it's going to prevent adherence. So the prevention of adherence is applying to bacteria. And this is going to be attaching to things such as the fimbriae pili to prevent the bacterium from being able to attach to a surface where it would then colonize and cause disease. And so the antibodies are going to prevent the bacteria from attaching to a surface, which is going to allow them to be cleared out through the immune system before they can cause disease. Then we also have um, neutralization. And this is going to be with viruses and toxins. So with prevent adherence, this is applying to bacteria. Neutralization is going to inactivate viruses and toxins. So I'm drawing two pictures here. I have a virus here with its spikes, and I just drew a circle with a toxin. If you remember, spikes are going to attach to a specific receptor, and that's how they're going to enter into a host cell. Toxins also attach to a specific receptor, and that's how they cause damage to our host cells. If we have an antibody that comes along and attaches to the spikes of a virus, like so, this virus no longer can attach to a specific receptor. Therefore, it's neutralized, or in other words, inactivated, so that it can't continue to replicate, and the immune system can come in and clear it out. Same thing happens with the toxin. If it's covered in antibodies, there's no way that this toxin is going to be able to attach to a specific receptor and cause damage. So sometimes neutralization is known as neutralization and antitoxin. Antitoxin is specifically referring to the toxin, but neutralization refers to both of them. The last one is agglutination. When you agglutinate, that means you're going to form clumps. So agglutination is where it's going to clump together. So it clumps together the antigen, or in other words, the microbe, and it clumps it together. IgM is going to be the best antibody that does this, and that's because it has the pentamer, and so therefore it can grab multiple microbes simultaneously. So for example, you have IgM with the five antibodies attached to each other, and now they can grab five different microbes with their antibodies. And the microbes now will not be able to move in their direction because they're all trying to move away, but they're stuck together. They basically become chained together. They get clumped together. And now the immune system can come in here and clear this out. So these are the four different functions that are associated with antibodies. In the next video, we're going to discuss how and the humoral response is activated and how plasma cells are activated to secrete the antibodies.